Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Coming Dogu podcast. I am Christopher Beljanovsky, and joining me in the virtual podcasting booth, as always, is the man, the myth, the legend, Toasty. What's up, what's up, Toasty? I'd like to extend a huge thank you to all those who have supported us so far. And if you are a first time listener, be sure to hit follow or subscribe as we have some great episodes lined up for the future. Finally, please share this podcast with your friends as it helps so much. My friends, it's good to be back. We're here to bring you a very unique episode today. Me and Christopher have been looking forward to this. Despite how there might be mixed reception around the community when it comes to Mortal Kombat 11, if there is one thing for certain that is undoubtedly held strongly in this title, it is the breathtaking, delightful music provided by its esteemed composer, Will Roger II. Today, we speak to the mastermind behind the music of this particular title. Without further ado, let's continue on with the show. All right, and here we are, ladies and gentlemen. Will, I want to thank you very much for coming on the show today. This is great. Uh, to begin, uh, tell us about your journey to become a composer. Was it something you wanted to do from a very young age, or did this career path become clear to you later on in life? Yeah, it's pretty surprising. Like, uh, I'd wanted to write video game music for an astonishingly long time, actually. Like, ever since Final Fantasy VII came out. So we're talking, like, what, 1990-whatever. Uh. And yeah. uh, I remember, like, I was, I was a, I guess, a freshman in high school. And I wasn't really actually into video games very much before that. You know, I was mostly just, like, a pianist. That was, like, all my spare time I would just spend, you know improvising and playing you know with all the classical music i was learning uh nice. in piano studies um but i uh got my first console it was the playstation one and for some reason i think it was because they had so many ads that made final fantasy 7 look like it was going to be this like cinematic masterpiece and you know <laughs> a cast of thousands you know those commercials that they had back then. <laughs> And I, I'd never seen a video game that had that style of storytelling that was so cinematic and like so deep and so rich in character. Um, and so, yeah, immediately I was attracted to it from uh, from a game perspective, a story perspective, also a tech perspective. It was a tech marvel back then. But uh, there's something about the music of that game specifically. I think, I, I mean, it's Nobuo Uematsu. He's obviously one of the greatest geniuses we've ever had in video game music but like i think there's something about ff7 score that's particularly simple and it's got this clarity to it that um uh, i don't think i've ever heard in any other score uh and sure it just felt so inviting it just felt like listen to this beautiful music this is so amazing and you can do it too that's like what the score just told me and so yeah you know all throughout high school i was playing more video games more jrpgs um I've been into fighting games uh, a little bit before that, and so I obviously continued. And uh, I was doing a lot of transcription as well. You know, this is way back in the day where there was no like MP3 or like YouTube or anything like that. And okay. there were albums of video game music, but you'd have to import them from Japan for like $200. So basically, <laughs> if you wanted to listen to your favorite music from, you know, whatever video game, you had to listen to the MIDI file that was painstakingly transcribed by some like Takes basement <laughs> dwelling nerd. And I was one of those basement dwelling nerds. I literally would play the game, get to the level with the music I liked, hit record on my tape recorder and transcribe note for note into, you know, general MIDI. It was the most laborious way you could possibly imagine. Uh, but I mean, that's what taught me uh, the fundamentals of composition. Uh, it taught me not only what like, you know these game music masters were doing, but also kind of why they did it that way, and you know all of the innards of of composition. And uh, from then, you know, I, all throughout high school and college and afterwards, uh, I was involving myself with at the time very nascent and unproductive game uh, game development indie community. Um, you know, scoring tons and tons of indie games that, of course, went like absolutely nowhere because this is long before unreal engine or anything like that uh, right. it's very very difficult to make anything let alone 
finish it and release it for who's going to play, you know, like this is before steam and even um, the dark ages. So, you know, it was, it was all that for a while, uh, but I was very passionate about it. I really wanted to make this into my full on career. Uh, ever since like sophomore year of high school, I wanted this to be my thing. And, you know, I went through college, I went to Yale University, studied music there. And um, after college, I started to get involved with more professional groups like the Game Audio Network Guild. Uh, I would go to um, Game oh. Developers Conference and kind of tried my best to immerse myself in that world and make a lot of friends in the industry and all that. And mm. eventually that led to my being hired as a music assistant, like music editor at LucasArts. So I worked at Lucas for ah. about five years, all the way up until 2013, the end, when uh, Disney um, bought it out. And, yeah. you know, that's, that's kind of when I had my first experiences uh, writing original music for AAA games, for doing like the implementation, which is like the tech side of um, music playback. Sorry. And... Um, I learned so much about just how video games actually work and how they're made. And uh, sure. I made a lot of friends, like designers, uh, a lot of sound designers as well, programmers, um, art team and whatnot. And, uh, you know, afterwards, I kind of started the career that I have now, which is doing the same thing, except as a freelancer. So independently contracting to different companies. Um, and you know, I mean, the list goes on. Like I've, I've been very, very astonishingly lucky in the different franchises that I got to write for. Um, one interesting thing about Mortal Kombat is that uh, my f first major gig outside of Lucas was a game called Lara Croft and the Temple of Osiris, uh, yes. which, by the way, just came out on Switch. Like I think it's it's like getting re released for for Switch now. And, heard about that. you know, that was such a amazing project for me because I got to do everything for the music in that game. I mean, I was writing the music, of course, scoring it. But Crystal Dynamics actually wasn't too far away from where I lived. We were both in the Bay Area. So they literally sent me home with a PC. They were like, hey, all right, take this and do whatever you want. And it, it was oh, basically wow. like a virtual desk in their office. Um, and so I got to just go right into the game's code and and place music and manipulate yeah. music however I wanted. Um, I could do things like, you know, I never played with God mode because I wanted to feel like the actual player. And so I would see like, okay, well, players are getting probably going to get stuck here. Why don't I write a new cue that can encourage them and make them feel better? Yeah. So it was like this weird, this angle wow. of game scoring that you don't really have an analog in any other field um, where it's it's an actual dialogue between the composer and the player. Um, well, uh, that game came out and, um, you know, very lucky with how well it was received, uh, particularly for its music. And I ended up giving a lecture on it at the aforementioned game developers conference. And, ah. uh, I didn't know this at the time, but apparently Rich Carl, who is the audio director of NetherRealm was in attendance and he had played the game and he had liked it. He wanted to, you know, check out the music. Oh, wow. Um, ah. well, fast forward and now it's. 20, I, I honestly don't remember, 2018, 17, 19, something like that. And uh, I just finished, I think, obviously I, I finished Call of Duty World War II um, and I think Guild Wars and Destiny expansions as well. Uh -huh. And I was looking for okay. the next thing. And I'm looking at my like, just like pile of PS4 games and I'm just sort of sorting them out like, okay, well, which companies probably needing another composer and which games did I just really enjoy? Like which games did I think had amazing sound design? Cause I want to attach myself to that. And Mortal Kombat 10 was just like the top of the pile. I was just like, dude, this game sounded amazing. Uh, I mean, it's got some of the best sound design I'd ever heard in a video game period, not just like, you know, a fighting game. And uh, I thought about it and realized that one of my friends who had made working on Call of Duty, um, he actually had worked at NetherRealm before going to Sledgehammer. So I asked oh, wow. him for an introduction and uh, I started emailing with Rich. And Rich explained, actually, uh, I went to that Lara Croft uh, lecture that you <laughs> did a couple of years back. <laughs> and you were one of the people who we wanted to talk to anyway. And this is exactly when we're uh, starting to think about music. So, yeah, you know, let's let's do it. And um I did sort of like a demo piece, like they gave me like a PDF explaining the story with Raiden and Kronika and all that. 
uh, you know, like a phone call. And, uh, and yeah, uh, the demo piece I wrote literally is the main theme of Mortal Kombat 11. And, uh, you know, I, I feel so lucky that I got to work on that project. I mean, it's it was like a it was weird because it was like an absolute dream come true. And you would think that I would have been a lot more nervous. But I think because Mortal Kombat was just part of my life for so long, it just felt so natural. Like I, the musical style, I didn't feel like I had to, you know, put on a mask or be a chameleon of some kind. It was just like write as you naturally would be writing. Um, Dan Forden, yeah. who is like the voice of Mortal Kombat, really, he did the music to one through four. Um, his style is very, very similar to just how I write naturally. And I don't know if that's because like I grew up listening to his music or if it's because we just have very similar influences with a lot of like 20th century um, art music composers like Stravinsky um, uh, and, and even like Bjork and like all these different like artists and whatnot. But uh, for whatever reason, it was just the most natural fit. Like normally I get hired for a gig and I'm just like, Ooh, well, <laughs> let's see what we can do. You know, like all <laughs> nervous and stuff. But for this one, this is the only time I've ever been hired for anything where I just felt like, yep, yeah, uh, you, you made the right call. <laughs> it really sounds like it was meant to be. And you mentioned that you have worked on quite a few, um, you know, big titles. Um, you mentioned Final Fantasy as a game that really inspired you, yeah. um, but what is it in particular about video game music that you find so appealing compared to, you know, like a movie, for instance? Yeah, that's a great question. I think a lot of it has to do with engagement of the player. Um, you know, if you play a game, right, you're going to be sitting there for maybe 11 hours, 40 hours, you know, 30, you know, it's, oh, it's know. quite a long mm -hmm. time. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and a fighting game, obviously, even even longer. And so it's like you have a lot of time to sort of establish not only just like mood, but individual themes and, and, and characters and ideas and concepts. Um, I think usually I, I think the only parallel there is maybe like a television series score. But I mean, TV, you have so little time to, to write. So, you know, obviously yeah. there's amazing television scores, um, shockingly good television scores. But I think with video games, you have that perfect blend of you have a lot of the audience's attention and you have a more generous, um, usually a more generous amount of time to produce the music. Um, I think also just the nature of it being interactive is an interesting challenge. There's always some weird thing that you have to do. Uh, it's never just like, hey, write a good piece of music. It's always like, oh, yeah, write good music, but this piece has to link to that one, and then it also has to do this, and then, you know, all that kind of <laughs> yeah. crazy. And, yeah. you know, it's it's always something new. There's always some new weird thing that you have to deal with, um, for better or for worse. And, uh, yeah, I mean, there's the other thing about game music that I personally love and kind of referred to with the Final Fantasy thing is that there's so much international influence um you know game music you can't you can't think about game music without thinking about japan uh you can't mm. you can't even say the word without immediately the uh you know the japanese greats of of yesteryear and of the current era um you know coming to mind uh in addition to obviously we've got some pretty amazing american game music legends as well as uh, oh, european course. game music legends um yeah once again you know both older era and and current era and so i think that's that's sort of one of the miraculous things about it is that it kind of transcends time and space i think that of every aspect of a game that survives music and perhaps story are the two things that will never get old um, you can listen to music from final fantasy 7 like now <laughs> and it Amen. sounds amazing just as amazing as it did in 1990 whatever is it 1997 sure. or uh, well, seven? Whatever. I think, yeah. I yeah. think seven or eight or something like that. Yeah. Were you a Mortal Kombat fan before accepting the role as composer for MK11? If so, who is your favorite character? And would you mind sharing some of your fondest combat memories with us? Sure. Yeah. So, uh, I'll go back actually even earlier. So this is now okay. seventh grade. I want to say. Uh, I had no video game experience at all. Just no game. My parents are like a little older. So, you know, there were no video games in the house. And I was at my friend's, uh, my classmate's like birthday party. 
at like some arcade. His dad just rented out the arcade and then, you know, his dad just plops a bunch of quarters in my hands. And I just saw this Mortal Kombat machine. I'd never heard of Mortal Kombat before, I don't think. But it was just, it was so amazing. It was like, whoa, these are real people fighting. This is so, because like the digitized characters and everything. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was silly. But to me, as like a seventh grader, it was like, this is the best. This is amazing. Video game graphics are never going to get any better than this. <laughs> and it was like Mortal Kombat 1 <laughs> or something. But, you know, I, I, I sat there for hours on end playing this thing. And that's kind of what introduced me to video games, to the martial arts, to game technology. Um, I was obsessed, like, from then. And then, of course, the film came out. Uh, notice that I put yep. film in the singular. We'll just, like, <laughs> interpret that how you will. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the film came out. I was obsessed with that. Uh, you know, and, man, I, just all throughout high school. My game actually was Mortal Kombat 3, because I think that was the only one that was on PC. I didn't get the PlayStation until much later. Um yep. But yeah, you know, just playing MK3 on PC constantly with the, the little <laughs> arrow keys and just, you know, typing away. Uh, you know, that was my whole my whole early high school. And then later on, um, Virtua Fighter sort of took over, which is a shame because like nobody plays Virtua Fighter, right? But like Agreed. later in high school. <laughs> um, wait, say again? I said I agree. Yeah, shame. Yeah, which is a shame because it's an amazing <laughs> game. But um, yeah, you know, Virtua Fighter all throughout high school and college was was my jam, uh, particularly Virtua Fighter 2. But uh, as far as favorite characters, so I've always been the Sub-Zero guy. I don't really play as him now because it's like mad different. And I'm actually <laughs> genuinely ter I'm actually worse at Mortal Kombat 11 than someone who's never played the game before. It's like actually kind of because <laughs> uh, I still play Virtua Fighter and Tekken and I'm like, you know, OK at those. But yeah. I don't know. Two D fighters, I guess, and me don't mix anymore. Um, but yeah, like in eighth grade, I think it was we had um, like wood shop class, and part of that was also like a sculpture kind of thing. And they said like you have to create a human head bust out of I don't know whatever plaster, whatever you know. Okay. And they wouldn't let anyone do characters. They wouldn't let anyone oh. do like, you know, because everyone wanted to do like, oh, I want a Ninja Turtle, you know, that kind of thing. They wouldn't <laughs> let anyone do that. But I got away with it with Sub-Zero, Mortal Kombat, because technically speaking, he's a guy. He's like a human being, sort of. Yeah. And for whatever reason, they were like, all right, sure, go for it. And I was like, yes, I don't have to sculpt the face. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'm going to have the mask and then it's going to be great. And I just found like, I'll, I'll share it with you. I just found photos of that sculpture. I have no idea where it is. But I found the photos. Uh, it looks terrible, nice. but it's like a seventh grader. It's <laughs> hey. pretty pretty good for an eighth grader. <laughs> the thought is there, my friend. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I want to share with you. So when I first fired up Mortal Kombat 11 and that track, A Matter of Time, yeah. started up, that gave me goosebumps. Um, mm -hmm. With Injustice being, you know, another franchise that NetherRealm, you know, produces they added a lot of um, cinematic flair to it. Yeah. And it was incredible to see that come to Mortal Kombat and also, you know, hear that Asian influence come in as well. Mm. So was this the brief that they gave you or did you bring that own style to the table yourself? Um, you know, the brief, they, they're very... So one of the things I, I love about um, working with NetherRealm is that you know, you're going to be working with like Rich Carl, who's he's a brilliant composer as well. He wrote a lot of the 3D era music and he's also worked at NetherRealm for like 2000 years. So at this point, he's <laughs> very interested in like, yeah, it's crazy, you know, <laughs> and uh, he's he's very interested in just hearing something new, um, which which I loved because that was like, you know, you're not you're not sitting there forced to sound like earlier entries in the franchise or anything like that. Um, he and the cinematics director, uh, Marty Stoltz, who it turns out actually worked with at LucasArts. I didn't realize until later. <clears throat> he was okay. the cinematics director on Force Unleashed. Um, yeah. But they're both very interested in two things. One, they want something new. And two, they love 90s action movies. Uh, yeah. it, it really shows. Like, now that I've said that, you're like, ah, oh, now that's why everything <laughs> kind of plays out in the way that... <laughs> And that, that, that was great for me as a composer. Um, number one, because like, yeah, I could kind of explore all of these different influences. I didn't have to be 
um, kind of boxed in by like, well, what's hip in Hollywood right now? But instead, I could basically, I mean, MK11 is, it's a 90s, 90s score. It's definitely a 90s score. It's not a 2000s, 10s, 20, whatever score, but it's, it's, maybe that's why I like it so much. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. It's as 90s as it gets. And um, the way that the world of music is incorporated is also um, something that you don't, I mean, sometimes you see that, I guess, but like, you know, the idea was every character needed some sort of a sound. And so every character in the game has its own, has their own uh, character themes. And a lot of times these themes are not orchestral in nature, but they're world music in nature. Like I wanted um, specifically Chinese sounds like the Gujeng for, uh, for Raiden and for Liu Kang. And uh, for Kronika, I mean, she doesn't, she's raceless, obviously, because she's this weird eternal, whatever she is, Titan. But um, because of the idea that she's got this uh, sand hourglass and she's constantly teleporting, manipulating time, for some reason that just like screamed, okay, I really want to try out some Middle Eastern instruments for this. Uh, And I already had a lot of contacts uh, uh, who played those instruments for my work on Lara Croft. Uh, because Lara Croft took place in Egypt. And so, uh, yeah, it was actually a pretty easy decision to just say for the main theme, all right, well, we have the Raiden side, which is going to be Gujeng, and then we have the Kronika side, which is going to be, um, what's it called? Kemenche, which is like a Middle Eastern fiddle. It's kind of played this way. And okay. then they kind of play off of each other. There's even like a, a drum battle moment, like halfway through where every two measures, it goes <laughs> yep. from like Eastern yep. instruments and then to the Middle Eastern and then Eastern, Middle Eastern. Um, That's brilliant. So that was kind of how that happened was like just setting up the conflict between the two uh, characters, the two themes. And I think that was Rich's idea. Um, I think he said like, if you can do something to show that there's like two opposing forces, that usually works really well. Um, there's certain scales that work really well with Mortal Kombat. It's called the octatonic mode. And if you just use that scale and a bunch of percussion, then there you go. It sounds like Mortal Kombat. You know, like it's, it's actually remarkably simple formula, except obviously, you know, you have to also find some way to make it interesting as you're, as you're going along. That's amazing. Actually, now that you mention that I'm playing that theme in my head and it sounds totally different. <laughs> <laughs> like it's amazing that now I've heard the story behind it. You know, mm. it, I can't wait to turn it up a bit later and <laughs> let it rip. So, <laughs> um, so moving on to the um, the expansive story mode, um, there's a whole heap of cinematic um, soundtracks. You know, through there, um, how does the process work? Like, do you compose around a scene that's already complete, or is there a bit of back and forth between you and the studio? So I think out of I don't, I don't mean to diss any other studio because obviously I, I really love all of the projects that I'm on and have been on. But out of any studio that I've ever worked with, I think that NetherRealm has their stuff together like so much better. And it makes sense. They've made the same game for like 20 something years, right? So it's like, sure. all right, well, you know. But they have a process in place for producing these cinematics that is so locked down. Um, I mean, beyond anything I've ever seen in, in TV or film either. I've never had to, I don't think I ever had to revise a piece just because like an animator or an editor added, added a little bit of time or subtracted a little bit of time from the scene or anything like that, uh, which is astonishing. Like normally that's like people have to hire entire staff just to deal with the reconforming of scenes when some editor has decided like, oh, let's make this slightly short. Uh, they don't do that at all. And I think that's partially because of the discipline of the studio. And I think it's also in part because, like I mentioned, Marty is such a 90s, uh, such a 90s director. I mean, like, I, I was so privileged. Like, 90s directors do a thing that very few action movie directors now do, which is to allow space for the music. I can't tell you how often I've scored things where it's like, you know, it, it's like, why is there even music here? Like, there's no time. I have to just constantly, you know, I'm just following yep. these edits that are so lightning fast that it's like, what's even the point of, of music anymore? Do you have any idea how many scenes there are in MK11 where it's just two characters walking towards each other for like an <laughs> astonishingly long time? But, you know, without music, it looks absolutely ridiculous. But once, you know, once you kind of sit down and, and think about it, 
you can say a lot just with characters walking towards each other. Like now that I've said Absolutely. that, look, look back on it. You'll be surprised how much time there is. <laughs> and Marty just allowed so much space for the music to be musical. Um, but anyways, like, yeah. So to be fair, I didn't get finished cinematics because then, you know, I would have had like a week to <laughs> finish the whole score. <laughs> so instead, um, they're very disciplined about locking down the timing. And, you know, maybe the animation isn't quite there. Um, sometimes it's like completely untextured characters, uh, which, you know, can be a little difficult because you can't quite see the facial expressions. Um, but mm. uh, I'll always have a uh, meeting with Marty and uh, Rich. And they would tell me like exactly what's going on. We would see the, there's some software they use where like I could see in real time um, the scene and we'd all be looking at the same thing. And if I had questions, I could just rewind back to this point and be like, well, what's happening here and all that. Um, and yeah, there's only been a few times where I kind of misinterpreted what was going on. And uh, they was like, hey, you know, could you kind of revise this because this is actually what's, what's happening. We'd like something more like this. Um, and yeah, it, it was very rare. And usually their revisions would just be like, we want you to be even more musical, like, you know, take even bigger risks. Um, right. They were always very encouraging with that, which I, I really appreciated. So how about we dive a bit more into the creative process involved with making uh, these tracks? Yeah. You start off with a blank slate, but what happens mentally and how do you then translate it into an auditory state? Yeah, so... Um, I mean, my first my first step, you know, is like kind of watching the scene and uh, what what they call spotting, which is when uh, there's there's like three layers of this, right? So first is the spotting with the directors, and what it means is that we're going through the scene and they're saying like, oh yeah, this is like the emotional contour, this is what's happening. Um, sometimes Rich would have ideas for music, like, hey, you know, maybe you should write a theme for this character or this concept or this location or whatever. Um, and then they would send me like a document that kind of summarizes, uh, their, their thoughts on what the music should do. Um, okay. but again, they were very liberal about it. They said like, Hey, this is what we think, but if you come up with something that's better then go for it, or like if the momentum of the music means that it has to carry over, you know, a little longer or shorter then you know, just use your best judgment. From there, I would put the uh, video file into my video editor. I use Vegas. And um, I would put down markers for like all of the different points in the video where something significant happened, um, which is just like a, a point in time. And then I can write some text explaining what's going on. And uh, from that, at this point, I, I'm starting to kind of get some ideas. So maybe I'll uh, write in text, like in those markers, like have low strings do a thing or have like a uh, Gujang melody, you know, things like that, or like, you know, put Raiden's theme here, it, those kinds of notes that are uh, quite musical in nature. Uh, and from there, I actually just go to paper. So I'm, I'm very old school like that. And I'll write out freehand, just sketching out ideas, just going out through time. Uh, because I have those markers, I can then write on the paper, like, hey, this section should be at like two minutes and 15 seconds or whatever. And this is what happens. And um, that kind of keeps everything in sync. And then I have my stopwatch and my metronome. And I'll kind of score it out on paper first. And when I'm happy with that, and I think like, OK, yeah, let's go. Then I'll go into the computer and start you know, inputting all the notes and, and uh, producing the piece. Um, you know, periodically, I'll render it out and take a look with the video to see if like, is this working? Is this, you know, uh, is the timing off or does it not feel right or whatever? And then I'll kind of revise based on that. Um, but yeah, you know, I'll, I'll do that. I'll, you know, record some of my, my own instruments or hire um, some of the soloists that I have on, on MK11 to, um, you know, to give the track a little extra uh, spice. And yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, then I'll kind of turn it in. And if they like it, then we just deliver, stem it out, send them all the different pieces and move on to the next one. So um, you mentioned previously that you worked for LucasArts for some time um, and now you're sort of freelancing. Um, has that process changed the way that you approach your work at all? 
Hmm. Uh, I want to say, yeah. I mean, LucasArts was kind of weird in that I always had like at least two jobs, right? Like if I was writing, if I were writing, then I also would be doing the, uh, well, usually would be doing some of like the implementation. If not on that same score, then like on a different game, I would be working. Like, so there was like a point where I was, wor- I was writing for Old Republic. I was doing uh, implementation tech stuff for um, Force Unleashed 2. And I was working on the Monkey Island special edition as like the music supervisor for that one, doing like basically uh, the, the tech stuff, setting up the tech, working with the Rangers, doing arrangements myself, and all, you know, the whole nine yards, um, all on the same day. I mean, it was actually kind of ridiculous. I would get wow. in at like 10, Ooh. work on one game until the afternoon, work on the next game until the evening, work on the next game until like 2 a.m. And then like go home <laughs> for a little bit and then <laughs> just for like a nap and then come back and repeat the cycle. It was like the most unhealthy thing you've ever heard of. Um, but regardless, uh, it was always a little tricky to be creative in that environment. Um, just because, you know, music composition is is so draining, like mentally. You know, you have to like take naps and stuff. It's weird. Maybe I'm just old, but <laughs> like, you know, I, I'm, I'm working <laughs> and I'll have to, you know, walk or take a nap or just distract myself just to have perspective on it all um and to make sure that the information is still there otherwise it's like i don't know what i'm doing um when i was writing at lucas it was tricky because you know i can be working on so i was doing the score for um star wars first assault was the final score that i worked on there and you know i'd be i'd be writing and it was a very difficult score to write for a number of reasons not the least of which being that it's star wars so you're you know trying to get the john williams sound of course um <laughs> but as i'm writing like someone would just walk into my office with like their little problems or whatever <laughs> and i had to deal with that <laughs> uh, and then you know back to it and you know some days it would be like well i just need to get some writing done um but then like uh, a tech problem would come up uh or the reverse would happen where it's just like i need to solve these tech issues but because I've like shifted gears from writing, which is such like, I know this is a flawed science, but like left brain, right brain thing. And because I'm shifting gears, I'm actually like stupid for a good solid day or two, just like trying to remember, <laughs> like, how do I do this? Like Unreal Engine, like what, uh, how do you know? And, you know, then eventually I get into the swing of it and then I can actually be productive. But at that point, now I had to get back to writing. And then it's like, oh, now I'm back here. How do I write music? What is that? You know, so it was very difficult to kind of keep that all in balance. And plus the whole nine to five thing is not. Um, well, obviously, it wasn't nine to five. It was more like 10 to 2 a.m. But, you know, it, yeah. it's not <laughs> I was going to say <laughs> not for not for me. You know, I, I'm I'm the kind of creative who just like whenever I come up with stuff, it's like I have to just work then, um, you know, like I, I keep score paper in my pocket wherever i'm going i have like waterproof post-it notes i keep in the shower i'm actually not kidding like literally i'll be <laughs> writing in the shower that's how i wrote chronica's theme yeah put that in the put that in oh, the really? podcast it was written in the shower wow. in a state of undress very soggy undress so <laughs> do with that what you will that information but no you know just anywhere i am at you know i i kind of need to be able to at a drop of a dime just like oh i don't want to forget this idea let me just kind of scribble it down and uh, that, that wasn't super compatible with clocking into an, an office and working in a studio. So, you know, there is that. The advantage, though, of course, is that I have, you know, like uh, my coworkers were right there and I love my LucasArts team. We're still hanging out like to this day. It's like people are actually annoyed by how tightly knit we are. Um, <laughs> and also, you know, great gear, great resources. And you're right there with the team. So if I have a question, then, you know, I can just walk over and ask someone. Um, a little bit more autonomy as well, believe it or not, because, uh, you know, I am the music supervisor. So there really isn't anyone besides me to say like, oh, you know, this, this isn't quite working. Um, and when something isn't working, then I know exactly why it isn't working. Um, whereas as a freelancer, some of the most frustrating stuff is when it's like, they just ask you, oh yeah, redo this. And you're like, okay, why? And it's like, just redo it. Like, oh, great, cool, thanks, you know. <laughs> or sometimes you'll you'll have to write music for something you've never even seen and, like, no concept, nothing, and then you're just going off of their, I don't know, text explanation of what they want, and you do it, and then they're like, no, this is wrong. 
it's like, well, <laughs> what do I, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what do I do with this information? Like, I'm just throwing music at a wall and hoping it sticks. Um, so there's like pros and cons of both. Um, but I'm very much more happy, I think, uh, working independently, um, than, you know, having to go to an office. Like my commute is a solid 10 feet. <laughs> it's just behind that curtain. <laughs> and then I'm, you know, Hey, I'm at work. You know, this is great. You know? Yeah. So maybe we'll be going back a little bit here, but tell us, Will, how did it feel the first time you heard your compositions performed by an orchestra? Surely you must have had mm. goosebumps. No, it was terrifying. I mean, that's that's what you would think, right? <laughs> like you'd think like, oh, this is so awesome. But uh, well, actually, let me it's 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 two things. One, it was the, the very first time I heard my music with orchestra was on uh, Star Wars, The Old Republic. Except okay. it was a remote recording um, in Bratislava. And um, I went over to Mark Grisky. He's the lead composer of that game. And I went over to his uh, studio. All of us were at his studio. There were like five composers on that project. And so we were just like remote monitoring. So, it, I mean, it was obviously great. They're an amazing orchestra, but it kind of, you know, you don't, you don't see them. It's just kind of sound coming out of a box. So it just felt like, wow, this is the world's greatest synthesizer. <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was a little surreal. Um, but, you know, obviously it, it was incredible. The thing is, though, that um, when you're recording with an orchestra, it costs roughly $5 per second. Every wow. second cost five dollars which means that like if you add up like you know the the players you got to pay them obviously and then you the renting the room and then all the engineers and then everything involved with it not to mention like all the costs beforehand like orchestration and, and parts printing the scores out is surprisingly expensive because like you know printing stuff you would when it's thousands of pages it's like oh crap uh which i found <laughs> out the hard way but <laughs> that's a whole other stuff <laughs> But yeah, it's five dollars a second, approximately. So like, it's it, the stress level is astronomical. And by the way, I think that Mortal Kombat was probably the most stressful that I've ever been recording a score. We recorded that in uh, Budapest, Hungary, but it was another remote session. And uh, I worked with Dynamedian, which is this German company that did the contracting. They set up like the video. Like if you look at, there's a YouTube video of the recording session, uh, which they produced and um, really, really beautifully produced actually. But you have to understand I'm Skyping in to a bunch of like German dudes who are then <laughs> translating into Hungarian <laughs> for the orchestra. <laughs> so it's this weird game of telephone. So if anything goes wrong, that's like, and also it's the internet. So that's, I don't know how many, like 10 seconds delay from Hungary to the United States, West Coast. So it's like if anything ever goes wrong in the session, like if someone plays a wrong note or like the horn section misinterprets, you know, whatever, then there's that whole like many, many dollars basically that you waste <laughs> if like it doesn't, you know, get it right immediately. So, yeah, that was we, we spent about an hour recording the main theme there and uh, it was so stressful. It was just sweating bullets the whole time. Uh, but I mean, obviously it, it worked out really well. Um, you know, they're again, a fantastic orchestra and they really nailed it. So, um, of all the tracks in Mortal Kombat 11, uh, one of my favorites is, I believe it's called strongest Jade, but oh, there's, yeah. there's tons of other ones that I love. Um, what is, which, which track, um, is your favorite? Um, what are you most proud of and which mm. one was the most challenging to produce? Well, most challenging is definitely, I don't know what. I think it's called Immortal Combat. It's um, it's when like the the final showdown where you know they're on their ships and they're finally landing at Kronika's oh, yeah. Keep and then Sub Zero yeah. like does his little slide down the thing, that whole thing. Uh, that was challenging because it's astonishingly lengthy. I mean, it's like not. It's actually like twelve minutes nonstop action music, um, just uh, unbelievably detailed and like so much going on and it's like okay just put all of the chips on the table for this one track <laughs> um uh, that was that was extremely difficult to, <laughs> like i can't even i can't even lie it was uh, astonishingly difficult um for me but you um, took loads of naps i assume yeah track. well I, I didn't have time <laughs> that's the problem <laughs> i think i had maybe a, a day or two to to write it and then a couple of days to um, to produce it. But I mean, it was just like, 
I, I did not sleep. It was just like, all right, take a little nap and then come back to it and then take a little nap, come back to it. I mean, it was just ridiculous, honestly. I mean, it was, it was so much fun. It was just like this absurd Herculean thing. And I feel like the DLC uh, had something even worse, but I forget exactly what it was. Maybe it wasn't worse musically, but it was like longer because the chapters are longer in the DLC for some reason. Yeah. But um, regardless, uh, my favorite... I don't know. That's a weird one. Cause like, um, there's so many moments in that, in that game. Like that's the other thing about these nineties style, uh, direction is that there's so many just moments and they're very memorable. Um, one that comes to mind is, you know, the, the Raiden and Liu Kang flashback that's across all the different dimensions and all the different mortal combats and stuff. And, yeah. um, I mean the story behind that one at least is, is funny. Like, uh, I remember, uh, I'm looking at the schedule and it's just like, I have to write so much music and I, I don't know how I'm going to have time for anything. And my, <laughs> this is going to sound messed up, but like my thought process going into that scene was like, okay, how can I do this scene as quickly as possible? <laughs> Cause I don't have time <laughs> to do like extremely detailed, you know, whatever. And then I realized yeah. like, okay, well, Rich and uh, Marty, they're expecting like this action scene, like this action pack, you know, whatever. Um, because you know the edits are super fast and like they're cutting and they, it's, it's brilliant fight choreography and all that um but instead i kind of realized well it's not really about the fighting that actually is just like on the surface what's actually going on is raiden is realizing something horrible that's been happening across all these different dimensions and so that's why i, I came up the, with the idea of like you know what let's not have action music at all Let's just have this pumping like pipe organ thing that just kind of grows and grows and the choir comes in and layers in. And it's more of like a tragedy that, you know, he and Liu Kang have been manipulated into becoming enemies time and time again uh, by Kronika. Uh, and so, yeah, you know, that's, I think, one of the one of my favorite examples of um, just trying something very daring, very different from what was expected. I think a lot of developers you know, if I had given them something like that, they would have been like, well, we asked for this. So, you know, please do what we <laughs> do what we asked. Sure. But, you know, Rich and Marty, they took a chance. You know, they, they were like, okay. you know what? That's kind of cool. Let's, let's go with it. And it ended up being like, I think easily the, you know, everyone's favorite scene in the game. Um, you know, especially like the fans who have been with it, you know, all throughout the 3D era and they're loving these 3D callbacks and, um, musically, there's not really much to it, but uh, especially now that I've admitted that I just did the easiest, <laughs> easiest way out. You know? <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I think that, you know, even beyond all of the difficult action music that I wrote, I think that was like just a moment where I got so lucky that I happened to, you know, stumble upon this solution. I loved writing Strongest Jade as well. Like that's like a, that one was a musical style that uh, I really enjoy working with. Um, funny anecdote with that one is like there's this moment where jade is fighting right so she like after um like all hell breaks loose and she's kind of running through the outworld and she takes out her staff and tries to fight off are they tarkatans that she's fighting i don't even remember yeah, I think that, yeah. yeah tarkatans and yeah. uh i remember i wanted just like this really aggressive string sound but it was like well you know and in that cue i'm just using like the synthesizer midi sample so it's not you know you're not going to get like the aggression that a live player could give you so what i did was i have this mandolin and i actually played it with a violin bow just like aggressively just shredding on this this is going to sound horrible i apologize but literally that's okay you know just shredding on this thing as loud as i possibly could doubling the um the synthesizer strings but like getting this really atonal yeah. and gritty kind of disgusting sound with it and uh <laughs> yeah i mean i i really loved like working in that sort of style defining what like outworld music should sound like you know maybe it is a bunch of tarkatans with like the wrong instrument when they found a bunch of bows <laughs> off of some human beings that they've like murdered and possibly eaten <laughs> and so they're like oh we can do that how hard you know <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> So Dan Forden has been with the franchise since uh, the very original game. Uh, tell us more in depth just how closely you worked with him on this particular game. 
Yeah, I actually didn't work with him uh, specifically on this. I think he focuses more on sound design now. Um, but he did write a few tracks for the for the game, um, uh, and I think also for the DLC, for like the uh, the in-game stage music. Um, I didn't write any of the stages uh, for MK11 uh, or the DLC actually, but sometimes they would like incorporate my themes from the story or like the main theme. Uh, so I actually yeah. didn't really interact with him, uh, and in fact, I never met him until uh, the launch party in in Chicago, like a month after the game came out. Uh, he's like okay. cool. He's like so cool. Like, everyone at the st it's weird. Like they're these legend Ed Boon as well. Um, you yeah. know, they're they're like just cool. I don't know how to explain. Like nobody has like a big <laughs> head about it. They're just like, oh yeah, we you know make this game. You know, it's cool. It's just like <laughs> it's just like our job or whatever <laughs> to make one of the biggest yeah. franchises in gaming history. I think what it speaks volumes that there's people, several people who've been at Nether Realm for like twenty years or more. Which is shocking. Like that does not happen at a video game company ever. But um, yeah. you know, NRS they you know they they do things right, and um, that's probably why people stick around making essentially the same game for like twenty years. <laughs> sure. Uh, what advice would you have for someone wanting to follow in your footsteps? Oh, like wanting to do uh, video game music, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I. I think there's a lot to it. Um, it's very difficult. There's a lot of um, a lot of people who are looking to get into game music, and there's a lot of uh, challenges that come with it. And there's not a lot of projects necessarily um, that that pay well, I should say. Um, but you know, there's a there's certain things you can do. Like I think in terms of actually getting work, um, it's very important to um, find ways to kind of befriend people in the industry, like going to industry events. Like I mentioned, Game Developers Conference. Uh, there's Game Sound Con, which actually I think is this week. It's online this year. Normally it's in Los Angeles. And uh, I think there's a lot of local IGDA meetups um, around the world, and um, which is a great place, again, to meet other uh, game composers, game sound designers, but also like just other people who are making games. Um, there's also game jams, which are when they just say, okay, uh, we are going to make an entire video game in like three days or like one week or, or two days or whatever. And those are a great way to, you know, just get practice and, and finish something and do something cool. Um, very low barrier of entry as well. I mean, there, nobody's ever gotten paid to write music for a game jam, of course, but like it is a great way to meet new people and, and again, to finish something, which I think is also very important. Um, in terms of the actual skill, however, um, my top advice is to do transcription. And I'm not, I'm not even kidding. Like that, that training that I had in the nineties where there were no MP3s and you had to, you know, transcribe note from note for this cassette tape that you recorded. Maybe you don't have to do the cassette tape part, but learning how to transcribe <laughs> note for note is, I mean, that's, that's actually how composers were taught like for hundreds of years before the current era where you can just like, you know, uh, find some program online and then just, you know, go to town. Um, they were learning by transcription. That's how they, you know, learn how to write music. Uh, I think it's an invaluable skill, especially for learning like form and harmony and, and melody even. Um, for learning production, obviously you have to just kind of dive in and do it, um, which is I think where modern composers excel quite a bit. Um, so there's always something to be learned there. You know, like there's so many incredibly generous YouTube channels that um, that detail like, OK, here's how to get this sound and here's how to do this synthesizer thing. And, you know, check this out. And I mean, we have so many great programs, a lot of them for free now that are, you know, you can literally just like the joke Tom Zimmer makes is that like, oh, you can have an iPad and make an, a blockbuster film with that. <laughs> Um, I mean, it's not exactly true, but I mean, essentially it's, it's, it's the same concept is that like, you know, all the tools are out there now it's very democratized. And so there isn't that huge barrier that there used to be of like, well, this person has all this great gear, but I can't do anything like that. Um, I think those barriers are gone. If you were asked, let's say to, um, to return as a composer for Mortal Kombat 12, would you come back? 
Oh yeah, if they if they called me with any if they t- called me up and said like, "Hey, we're trying something a little different now." Barbie's Horse Adventure 6, I would be like, "Well, let's go." <laughs> 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 what can I do to, you know, really horse it up, you know? But no, I mean, it was it was an amazing, uh, amazing time. Not only, wor- honestly, not only working with the NetherRealm team, but just like the fandom. Um, they, they've got to be my favorite fan. They were so supportive on Twitter and uh, YouTube, everything. I mean, uh, you know, and I am a fan of the of the games. I've played every single one. And it's just like, you know, just being a part of creating the games is, is so so great it's also great being on the other side of ed boone's trolling like actually knowing the truth <laughs> when he comes up and <laughs> says all kinds of ridiculous shit um excuse my part of my yeah. french sometimes i don't know actually there yeah. was lots of stuff that they didn't tell me while i was scoring the games and so i i had no idea i had no idea that melina would eventually show up i just thought this was like funny to tease people but here she is you know all right cool you know. yeah yeah <laughs> okay well we are now going to move on to the last segment uh, of this episode and it is called final round so what we're going to do here is we're just going to ask you a couple of quick questions. We're going to try to get to know you a little more. So with that being said, question number one is, what is your favorite color? Blue. <laughs> Navy blue specifically. Nice. So now the Sub-Zero thing makes a little bit more sense. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what are some of your other hobbies? Um, I used to be really into weightlifting. Um, I'm not quite so much anymore. I don't want to like, it sucks blaming other things for your problems, but like, you know, because of the whole COVID quarantine, the gyms closed and then they temporarily opened up and then I got injured. Um, so I'm like spending about a year in kind of rehab from that, but, uh, hopefully I'll get back into it. Uh, cause that was a fun way to do something that has absolutely nothing whatsoever with video games or music or anything like that. Just clear your mind and yeah. lift heavy crap for a little while um <laughs> i'm still into virtual fighter virtual fighter came back it's so great i mean it's like it's like my comfort food now as far as video games go and you know i love i mean i love like you know the souls born series of course bloodborne is maybe my second favorite game of all time um Okay. And but uh, yeah, as far as as video games go, most of my time these days, which sucks because I have a PS5, so you think I'd play like PlayStation Five games. <laughs> but now that I've beaten Demon Souls and I'm waiting for like Elden Ring and um, Guardians of the Galaxy and all that, like uh, you know, I just it's the Virtual Fighter machine. <laughs> <laughs> what is the best piece of advice you've ever been given? Ooh, that's a weird one. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I wish I had a good, a good like <laughs> stoic that's and it. brilliant answer to this. But um, yeah, I mean, I have, I've had, I've had people who are very supportive. Um, there's a, there's a legendary American game composer, uh, Peter McConnell. He just, he just did uh, Psychonauts two. Uh, brilliant score, brilliant game. And um, I remember when I was working on the final LucasArts project, which was Star Wars First Assault, um, I don't even remember the context because he wasn't working on it, but, um, you know, somehow we were just in contact and he was just like, oh, just give me a call. And I was like, I just felt lost, right? Because like I'd suddenly, now I'm the music supervisor and composer and like I'm, you know, like so many steps you know, above what I was doing before and just looking for any, you know, pillar to, you know, set something down and, you know, whatever. And I just remember he was very, um, very adamant about saying like, you know, you, you think that you have to make this big, big score with big moments, big everything. Think small, you know, think small, think about like, what can I do with like less instruments, less, you know, less of everything. And just kind of go from there, and and uh, the the solutions will present themselves that way. Um, now, uh, obviously, what I wrote was was quite gargantuan in the end, but like starting from that <laughs> perspective of like think small, think small. Um, yeah, uh, you need to you need to actually hear this score to understand 
what that meant, but like in the context, it, it made perfect sense, which is weird because he didn't even know what I was writing, but it was just like his mentality of like, just start small. And then if complexity has to happen, then it'll happen. But like, you know, start from a, a point of clarity. Um, and if you listen to his music, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's brilliant, but like it has this sort of clarity to it. And so that was, that was great advice that, you know, I, I sometimes need to remind myself of. <laughs> <laughs> Will, do you have any secret talents? Secret talents. Yeah. Or tell us something that mm. most people don't know about you. What do people know? <laughs> yeah, that's a weird one. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I'm <laughs> astonishingly bad at juggling. Like, like I can do like once and then it's like, oh crap, you know that. Yeah, I don't know. I don't. <laughs> you and me both. Yeah, I mean, I can deadlift five hundred pounds, but that's not really a secret. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what is your favorite food? I would have to say ramen, like real okay. Japanese uh, ramen. Um, I had the pleasure of going to, I think, the final Tokyo Game Show before you know quarantine hit, and uh, that was my first time in Asia, and. Just the food was astonishingly good every single day in Tokyo. Oh my goodness. Like it's, it's almost difficult to find a bad meal in Tokyo. And one day uh, we went to this ramen spot and it's crazy. Cause like you order from a vending machine outside, like you pick out what you want and then you wait outside for a little while. And then they bring you in once it's like time to order and you've already paid and stuff. And uh, it, like I was hanging with some game developer buddies of mine and uh okay. you know we were all chatting it up and stuff you know because we're all very one of them actually worked at snk like way way back in the day on like these old old fighting games and stuff um yeah as soon as the rama came out like all the talking stopped <laughs> all the talking stopped <laughs> and it was just like it's that time. this heavenly resplendent like i can't even describe how good it was it was just oh my god i love ramen but like that was like it was astonishingly good whole other level yeah it, a whole other yeah. level absolutely um who have you met that has left you starstruck you know uh ed ed was one of them actually i met ed at the dice awards <laughs> in las vegas um mortal Kombat. i'm pretty sure no no, no. injustice maybe it must have been injustice I too think so yeah had one for best fighting game and Call of Duty World War II was up for um, best original score. And, uh, you know, I, I got the nomination. We didn't win. I think Cuphead won that year. Um, but we all, you know, got to invite to like after party. It was like this, you know, huge you know, rooftop kind of thing in Las Vegas. It was very ritzy. And uh, I was there with the audio director of Sledgehammer and I think my um, publicist and, and some other folks. And uh, I saw this guy and I'm like, yo, I think that's Ed Boone, that's Ed Boone. And the publisher's <laughs> like, oh, just go talk to him, just go say hi, you know, it's fine. And I'm like, I don't know, I'm so nervous, I'm so nervous. <laughs> and I, I went up to, you know, this is, remember, this is long before I started working on MK11, but like, I went up to him, I was like, sure. Hey, Ed, um, c congratulations, you know, whatever. And he's like, he's super nice, because I'm sure he sees this all the fucking time. So, yeah. but yeah, you know, he, yeah. he was nice about it. I'm sure he, thankfully, he probably forgot about me. <laughs> It's like, that was like super <laughs> awkward. Um, the funny thing is that I, I run into George Lucas several times, but um, the thing about George is he's so down to earth. It's like crazy. It's, it's unbelievable. This is like a billionaire who's uh, influenced film storytelling, you name it, video games, like so much. Yeah. Uh, and he's just cool. Like, I don't know how to, he's like the dude from Big Lebowski. He's just like, cool like i'll be at the, the dude <laughs> yeah yeah i'll be at like the the winter party you know we had like winter parties at, at lucasfilm and you're seeing you just like dress up nice and then you know this fancy whatever and you just be like standing in line to like get some soup or whatever it's just <laughs> just just like a normal <laughs> and not no no pretense no whatever there was one time where i yeah. at the halloween party um i dressed up in a jedi robe but I also had these like aviator sunglasses and a microphone and I would just <laughs> interrupt people. I was Qui-Gon Ye West. <laughs> yeah, it was terrible. 
<laughs> pun costumes I don't recommend, um, especially because there was a moment where it was like this balcony situation, long hallway. And here's George coming this way. And here's me coming that way. It was like no one in between. So he's just like takes this long and he took this long stare at me like, oh, <laughs> and I was so worried that like, oh, no, am I going to be responsible for like the rapping Jedi in the next Star Wars movie? It's like, <laughs> is this my fault? The sequel to Jar Jar? It's even more offensive, you know, but thankfully that never, <laughs> thankfully that never happened. But like. Yeah, and, you know, George, was, he was just super cool. So that, I wasn't starstruck from that because it was just like, just he's just so normal and cool, you know. Yeah. Uh, what is your guilty pleasure? Guilty pleasure, like video game or or film or, or something food like that? Or, or, yeah. Food? Uh, I used to be really into donuts. But <laughs> somehow, I don't know, like once quarantine hit and I couldn't take the gym for granted anymore. Um, ah. and then like the gyms temporarily opened up, I like went really hard at it and it became obvious that like, if you just like eat a donut, <laughs> you can't expect <laughs> even like the next day to, to be okay. Like with like an intense workout. And so you it, will it, begin it, to look like a donut. <laughs> yeah, well yeah, exactly. Well, you, you'll just feel so like, like I can't do it. What's going on? My superpowers have drained or whatever. And so, um, I don't know. It's it's kind of messed up, but like donuts have like lost their uh, their hold on me or whatever their appeal since then, um, which is actually kind of sad now that I'm thinking. About it. <laughs> it's just like they taste empty now because I can taste how unhealthy it is, and it's just like I can feel like the pain that'll come later on, I guess, or something. I don't know. So, yeah. But yeah. <laughs> and finally, what's the funniest thing that's ever happened to you? The fun- oh man, I can't answer that question. There's so many. I can't. Yeah, I, <laughs> the funniest thing is. I mean, well, the rapping Jedi thing is pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> epic. That's not. <laughs> that's pretty awesome. Uh, I don't know. I try my best to block out the embarrassing memories from my mind as quickly <laughs> as possible. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I I'm gonna have to default to the rapping Jedi. Yep. <laughs> That's great. It's a good one. <laughs> See the previous answer. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, before we exit here, um, where can people find you on social media and follow your work? Yeah. So I'm on Twitter. It's just at Wilbert Roger. And um, I'm also like, you know, rogermusic.com. And uh, I, th- I think Twitter is like where I'm the most active uh, right now. Good to know. Me and Christopher just want to thank you again. We really appreciate your time, Will. Absolutely. Well, great great chatting with y'all. Okay, and here we are. We've come to the concluding point of this episode. It's been a very intriguing chat today. We are most grateful to have had this opportunity, and we're more than happy that you have seen this today. Ah, now that everything has been said and we're wrapping this up, I think I'm going to do me a solid and turn on that MK11 soundtrack I got handy. That doesn't sound too bad, does it, Chris? Oh, yeah. Okay, fellow combatants, you know how it is. Have fun, stay safe, and stay flawless.